Hi, good evening. My name is Dr. Betty Tonzing. I'm on the board of the Indiana Council of World Affairs. And I want to welcome you to our program this evening. This is a part of Great Decisions. Um, and this is the end of our program season. Uh, I feel a little bittersweet. We've had a wonderful program season um, between distinguished speakers and great decisions. We've brought to you many programs across the global spectrum. Some of you, as I've said, have been with us for most of them. And some of you are come because you're specifically interested in one topic. But this is our last program of the program year. And we have enjoyed this immensely. The board is going to be getting together sometime soon to sort of talk about what is next year's program going to, program year going to be like for 2023, 2024. And I, I think when Zoom first started, the only thing people could think about is, well, when are we going to get back to normal? And virtual programs really have become the new normal. And we like the fact that we have both been able to bring in speakers from just really wherever they happen to be. Um, we have enjoyed wonderful talent right here in Indiana and in central Indiana, but we also have been able to bring in speakers from around the world. And from around the world, they have come, as have our audience. And that's been very exciting. And there's so sometimes people will just um, speak up at some moment now and say, well, I'm from Pennsylvania and I'm from Tennessee. Well, I'm from France. And that is extremely exciting. Um, and we would like to continue that opportunity. We also are perhaps aiming at looking at a life program or an in-person program in the fall and in the spring. Might be a lunch program, a special topic. Um, and if you are in central Indiana area, um, even up to Lafayette or Bloomington, you know, it, it's still a good drive up and where anywhere within Indiana to come. Um, so, but th these are things we're going to be looking at. But for sure, what we are definitely doing is again next year presenting you what is timely, what is urgent, um, and uh, and your participation this makes it all worth it. I want to say before I go on to introduce this evening's speaker that there is excuse me, one opportunity that you can come to. Excuse me. If you are in central Indiana, or it doesn't matter. I mean, you might want to just come because it's going to be so much fun. On May the 23rd, which is a Tuesday evening, from 5 till close the place down, which in this case is 9 o'clock at night, <laughs> not midnight, at Urban Wines in Westfield, Indiana, and I believe it might be a place I've been to, and I'm often suspect of Michigan wines or Indiana wines, but I believe I've been to Urban Wines, and they actually did have a nice cab that I rather enjoyed. Yeah, it was quite good. Uh, but what's going to be even better is your company. And there's also going to be some charcuteries that you can um, buy, um, and it's up to you what you drink. And what you eat is entirely up to you. Uh, there is no registration for attendance. There's no fee to attend. It's just you can uh, just have water. You can have iced tea. Um, this has been wonderfully arranged by Claire Collins, who's on the board of the Indiana Council of World Affairs. And she gets a big, big kick. She, If you've been to any of our international dinners or international adventures, uh, she is a person who's been largely responsible for making those happen. She takes great delight in finding a new and exotic and delicious place for us to attend. And that's going to be an opportunity for us to come in person. So if you can make it, you have to register, though. We do need a registration because we do need to let Urban Wines have an idea of what's coming. Now, Ray, who's uh, our board president and will be moderating this. Ray, is there anything else we need to announce that's coming up that we want our friends to know about? Um, well, the only thing will be sometime maybe after July 1st to those of you who are members will probably receive a uh, notification to renew your membership. And we certainly encourage everybody to do that. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, it costs money to keep the organization up and running here. So uh, your membership is really valuable to us. Uh, for those of you who aren't members, we really would appreciate you taking a look at uh, joining there's a number of different levels um, of membership you can uh, sign up for so uh, 
That would be the only sales pitch I would give there, Betty. Right. And I want to say also that membership says something else, and that is that you do support us, not just in terms of money, but that you say, you know, I'm glad you are here with these programs. And as we reach out to find sponsors, which we're going to try to do next year, we want to get deeper with our sponsors. I'm very pleased to say that the sponsor this year and possibly for next, um, if there are some folks up there that we can work with, um, was the Central Indiana Community Foundation. We were very, very pleased to have them be a sponsor for uh, for distinct uh, for great decisions. <laughs> I get the two programs, but I'm introducing them each each week. Um, distinguished speakers. No, great decisions, great decisions, and we were very, very pleased to have them. Um, but it means something if we can say to them. It means some, two things. This is how many people come to the program, but it also means something we can say. We have this many members because what that says to somebody who's thinking of sponsoring you is how important are you out there in the community? Do people care that you are here? And, and your membership tells us you do, and we know you do. So we hope that you can please consider being a member. The base price is $50. Isn't that right, Ray? Yes, $50. $50 and then the uh, world leader level is at $150. And so the... Uh, the membership includes the uh, subscription to the uh, daily chatter and the uh, the weekly quiz. So you get uh, some mem member benefits. That and those are really fun. You get that every week. And for people uh, like like all of you, I know are, are globalists or the nationalists, uh, it's really fun to kind of test your uh, you uh, your your skills on what's going on in the world. Now, if you're a global citizen at $150, that will give you a free, uh, we will send you a free, the publication of Great Decisions. As you know, this particular speaking series comes with a really excellent publication. And some Very people good. keep them to actually use them to perhaps prepare a lecture from it, um, to it, it, they're very well informed and we will send you a free, um, uh, and that's a, a good value right there because the cost of that magazine, you know, the journal just keeps increasing a little bit every year. So that's a very good value that you would get at the $150 level. Okay, with that, I am very pleased to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Lopez. We've had an absolutely delightful conversation uh, with Dr. Lopez before you all were able to join us. I think you're going to enjoy this evening. This uh, speaker has an outstanding background for this evening's topic. Um, he is with the University of Notre Dame, where he's with the uh, Reverend Hesburgh, Father Hesburgh, Father Ted, uh, Professor Emeritus of Peace Studies at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. And this is one of the outstanding peace studies centers really in the world. And he was a founding faculty member in 1986. And Dr. Lopez was telling us how he had come from um, Earlham College in Richmond, Virginia, where he had been teaching for over 11 years and was going to be a part of this program. And he asked him to be a part of the faculty in doing so. And for those of you who know, uh, the Quakers have a profound background um, as peacemakers and are often called in um, for the most difficult situations in the world to help mediate because they have the ability to see something good in everyone and having an inner light and are really fantastic, bringing an unbiased uh, feeling of moderation. And he had done outstanding work there and Notre Dame said, hey, we're founding this Croc Center, Peace Studies, we might, we could use your expertise. And so he has helped them build that program. He served as interim executive director of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in 1997 and served as its board of directors presiding over changing the hands of the doomsday clock in 2002. And I think you all know what the doomsday clock is, uh, and Dr. Lopez can explain a little bit more. And that clock is, that, that hand is ticking closer and closer to midnight, I, I think. Uh, as a senior research associate at the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs in New York City from 2001 to 2002, he assisted with the council's post 9-11 public programming throughout the US. Dr. Lopez holds a senior, um, senior Jennings Randolph Fellowship at the United States Institute of Peace, and he served as vice president of the Academy for International Conflict and Management and Peace Building at the United States Institute of Peace. Um, in, in the fall of 2019, he was named as one of the inaugural non-residential fellows of the Quincy Institute 
and responsible statecraft. Since 1992, Dr. Lopez has advised, has advised the United Nations and, and various other international agencies and governments on economic sanction issues, which is this evening's topic, ranging from assessing their humanitarian impact to the design of targeted financial solutions, and has just finished a year of service on the panel of experts for monitoring sanctions on North Korea. Of course, Dr. Lopez has with this a number of publications, books, uh, articles, published articles, and is a frequent media commentator regarding sanction issues writing for uh, journals such as The Hill and Responsible Statecraft. He is indeed the person we want to hear from this evening with profound experience and depth to talk about this evening's topic. And with that, I'm going to ask Ray Montagna, my fellow board member, to begin our program with us with Dr. Lopez. All right, thank you very much, Betty, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, George, it's really a pleasure to have you here tonight. Um, and uh, to bring your expertise to, to our group. Um, and maybe we could start out talking a little bit about uh, what the Croc Center does at, at Notre Dame and maybe some of the programming that's been going on up there and how you were involved in that. And uh, talk a little bit about that for those of us who might not know much about that. Well, thank you. Thanks, Ray, for that invite to kick off that discussion. And Betty, thanks to you and Amy and others at the Indiana Council of World Affairs for having me. Um, and you're, you're probably going to have to stop me, Ray, because if I get going on how just wonderfully blessed I've been over the last 30 plus years to be at the Kroc Institute, uh, uh, I probably need to be stifled at some point about that and turn to sanctions. But in I'm trying 19... to cook here. So. All right, there you go. In, in 1986, I received an invitation from Father Ted Hesburgh to come join some other faculty, particularly those at Notre Dame, but one or two others who would come new like myself to create a center which um, had been endowed by Mrs. Joan Crock, the heir to the McDonald's fortune, and a way in which the first and primary program was a master's degree in peace and conflict resolution, very tailored to practical dynamics and conceived that we'd bring in 20 students a year, 18 of which would be from outside the United States in countries that were experiencing war or had experienced war. And so this, I used to call it a kind of Noah's Ark of the, of the globe of wars. We'd bring two people from Congo, two people from uh, El Salvador, two people from Palestine and various other places train them for a year and then send them home to be peace builders. And the master's degree was the center of our attention. Uh, and, and since 1987, when it began, we have over 500 graduates out there doing various things, ranging from ambassadors to their country now, to a, a major judge on the International Criminal Court, to folks who are uh, head of research at the Arms Control Association in Washington, DC, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, we then turned our attention, especially occupied my time, to the undergraduate program, where we created uh, and built from what was already there a marvelous interdisciplinary program to enroll undergraduates in both a traditional major and uh, an accompanying major in peace studies, in which we again trained for specific skills, et cetera, but dominated as Notre Dame was uh, by American students. And then uh, about 12 years ago, created a doctoral program in peace studies to create those who would train and create peace studies programs in other colleges and universities. But being Notre Dame as a major research university, we also engaged in lots of research. First, what constitutes the new peace building as the Cold War was coming to an end in the late 1980s? And for my colleagues and, and myself, an interest after 1990 in the invasion by Saddam Hussein of Kuwait, uh, the work of the United Nations in turning to economic sanctions as an alternative, at least at the start, to going to war. And we became fascinated, David Courtright in particular and myself, with the prospects of economic sanctions as a way to enforce rule of law, as a way in which 
when dictators came to the uh, top of their country and started oppressing some of their, their own country people for their own ideology, that we might impose sanctions on dictators to constrain their resources to do those things. We explored the possibility of sanctions playing a role in nuclear disarmament of particular countries. And then we became more and more interested in the relationship between the research we were doing and actual practice. So we were privileged to become key consultants, not only of the United Nations, but the European Union and our own United States government. Um, we turned our attention in the late 90s to the development of targeted financial sanctions as an alternative to general embargoes and also to increasing the effectiveness of arms embargoes. So I've been particularly involved in um, doing a lot of this research, but also in, as Betty mentioned, bouncing in and out, particularly after uh, my emeritus retired status developed over the last couple of years with working in the applied area of um, United Nations work and a larger international coalition that is trying to develop a code of conduct to make sure that unintended consequences and harms to civilian populations don't flow from sanctions coming about. And that's the work that I spend most of my time on now, especially as my year at the panel of experts looking at North Korea has concluded. Um, all of this has been central to the work of CROC. Uh, so too have various other important research projects like the way my colleagues monitor the peace agreements in about 20 different countries but have a special focus and a vested interest uh, in building peace in Colombia, Latin America. I'll stop there. All right, well, very good. That's that's very interesting. Uh, I think that gives us a flavor for uh, what's going on at the Croc Center and I appreciate that. Um, so let's, we'll start out here, the, kind of the common wisdom, you know, when a, an offending country does something that we don't like, um, for example, Russia invading uh, Ukraine, uh, it, it's like we, we envision three options. Either we do nothing, we do military action, or we do sanctions. Is there some other way we can be thinking about uh, the approach? Oh, what happened? I think that um, we, we are doing lots of things outside of those three particular choices. One is, um, Diplomacy, at its best, has available a set of tools and a toolkit, one of which is economic sanctions, one of which might be the use of military force, and a cluster of others being different levels of engagement with countries and targets about the international law that's being violated or the norm practices that are, that are uh, really raising concerns throughout the rest of the globe. And so... I see the the long uh, scale, if you will. Yes, military force is the most extreme end, probably after all the other techniques and approaches has failed. But diplomacy and engagement beyond doing nothing begins a cycle that includes economic sanctions and other things. One of the findings from our research and something that's continually validated in, in working with the UN and the European Union is that sanctions work best when they're understood by the leaders that are imposing them that this is one of the tools of a larger policy that tries to cope with either this invasion of another country or the violations of human rights or the building of new nuclear forces that are prohibited by international law. In other words, leadership and how leadership uses sanctions and continues to accompany it with engaged diplomacy is really the secret to the times when sanctions are successful. Mm -hmm. How successful are they? Often people ask. Most of the data since the 1990s says about 30% of the time. In some areas, more successful than others. We're much more successful in using sanctions to curtail or turn back the development of nuclear programs, whether it was South Africa in the late 70s, Argentina and Brazil and their development of nuclear capability in the 80s and 90s, <laughs> Iran, and I would say Iraq. One of the dilemmas of the pursuit of war in 2003, 20 years ago, was we were told it was a war that had to occur because the sanctions had failed. 
And what happened when we got there? There were no nuclear weapons hiding under Saddam's bed or anywhere else. Our research team was one of the few that was working very hard to try to convince President Bush and others that you had already won in Iraq because of the effect of the sanctions prohibiting the development of weapons. But unfortunately, we had to learn that, and the Iraqi people paid a big price for uh, deciding that war was necessary because we assumed that sanctions had failed. We've been less effective, as certainly the cases of Myanmar, Nicaragua, and some other places show us, in using sanctions to topple human rights violating dictators. Um, so we've been maybe, very. Maybe we could kind of parse that a little bit. Are some characteristics in these places that lead sanctions to be more successful than others, or is it more external or internal the, the success of it? That's a great question. One of the key criteria for success is when there is a broad agreement in the international community at its best level, UN Security Council imposed sanctions that other nations like the United States can add to and help implement and enforce. Sanctions that come solely from the United States or a small cluster of nations often are less successful. So multilateral are always more successful than unilateral. The big multilateral actor that entered the stage in the 2000s was the European Union. You know, the European Union has in place 40 sanctions regimes against not only clusters of leaders or countries engaged in bad activities, but also in international actors across national boundaries like Al-Shabaab and others that are also the subject often of U.S. sanctions and the like. So one of the first criteria of getting to that highest mark of, of 33%, it's multilateral. The second is the one I've mentioned. Sanctions aren't the policy. Sanctions are a tool of a multifaceted policy that includes extensive global engagement with the target, trying to persuade it that remaining under sanctions is the wrong thing to do. We went through a period of time in the last couple of years where it was prominent thinking by many in the United States that sanctions were meant to bludgeon a target to death, literally. Keep the foot on the neck, maximum pressure sanctions, totally isolate Iran or North Korea, and we will defeat them economically and we'll get political change. All the evidence suggests that is not the way to do it. When we did build an agreement with Iran, to not only reduce its amount of preparation of uranium, but to have international inspectors come in and monitor that independently, that was based on continued discussion and negotiations while sanctions were being imposed and while they were in place. So using sanctions with diplomacy and with engagement is critical. The other part that's really critical is to be able to make clear to a local population that you are the innocent people here, we're going after the leaders. And that's supposed to be the genius, if you will, of targeted financial and other targeted sanctions on particular commodities and products, that we go after leadership, we freeze the bank accounts of those who are uh, perpetrating these bad policies and try to prevent that from having undue unintended effect on the civilian population. Right now, a big discussion among sanctions experts in Washington and elsewhere is how do we impose sanctions very quickly on the ruling generals of the factions in Sudan who seem hell-bent on driving that country to destruction through civil war in order to retain their own ability to decide who rules. If we impose a lot of banking and individual sanctions on some of those, we may be able to bring a ceasefire and bring these folks to the table. So those are some of the criteria of success. The 15 major sanctions that the United Nations still has in place in certain areas, particularly those under civil war like Congo, et cetera, when they're accompanied by peacekeeping forces, by a special representative of the secretary general to continue to engage diplomacy, that heightens success. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Nicaragua and El Salvador. Is there some particular reason those have not worked? Um, 
I think it's the same reason that it didn't seem to work uh, against Gaddafi at certain times or against Putin now. When you have a leadership that decides we will rule the way we choose, it's not the international community's business or anybody else's business. And if we're suffering economic costs, we'll pass them on to our opponents politically uh, and we'll find ways that we can we can discover some partners, other countries who will help violate the sanctions and find a place for our imports or exports. Those kinds of things are what contribute to the sanctions not working. When you have Myanmar's leadership systematically destroying the democratic institutions and we freeze the bank accounts of 300 people right away thinking that'll make a difference, if most of their money is held in China, it doesn't matter that we froze it in London and New York. And if China is willing to be an exchange partner for a number of their basic goods, we're in trouble getting those sanctions to hold. Yeah. So if we, as, as you're talking here, I'm thinking that we can kind of view sanctions on a continuum from, I don't know what the right term is, less violent to where it's financial for leaders versus blockades that may affect food supplies and so forth as kind of being more violent towards the citizenry. You know, is there, who, who makes those decisions about how, the, which kind of sanctions we're gonna use uh, is there an international body that kind of monitors that and says, hey, you know, you've chosen this particular sanction that's having a negative effect on the, on the population. Maybe that's not what you should be doing. Yeah, no, that's, a, in fact, it has developed over the last 20 years to be a very complex and dynamically interactive system. Obviously, nation states control most of the global economy and the richest of them in Europe, the United States and elsewhere control a significant amount. But the UN Security Council, as the body that represents the globe, when it passes sanctions, it calls on all states to be part of that. So whether it's sanctions against uh, Al-Qaeda after 9-11, or Al-Shabaab for its activities in East Africa, or the leadership of the Democratic Republic of Congo, for uh, human rights violations within its country, the sanctioning body determines what type of sanctions and monitors how they want to adjust those so it focuses mostly on leadership. But we also have some great international organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross, Global Witness, um, Human Rights Watch, various think tanks concerned about the impact of sanctions on children and the most vulnerable in societies who serve as regular monitors of these and feed into the sanctioning units, whether they're single states like the United States or the European Union, to make sure that there aren't food shortages caused by sanctions, that the general standards of making sure that medical supplies are not interrupted those things happen. Um, the code of conduct that a number of us are examining in detail next week in Britain is designed to have a list of things that sanctions countries should do at the moment of designing sanctions and then should monitor as the time goes on so they can make adjustments on this. The legitimacy of sanctions is going to be based over the long term on them not only producing some political results, but not casting economic pain, again, on those who are not responsible for the particular policies the sanctioning countries are objecting to and trying to change. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I think as I was reading the article in, in the briefing book, um, I was kind of surprised in discussion of uh, how many people have actually died as a result of sanctions. And, and it was like, I mean, to me, it was almost shocking. And I was uh, I just wondering why the media never really kind of got involved in kind of reporting on these, some of the impacts of sanctions. And you, you have a feel for, you know, do they not understand what's going on or? Um, and, and I will say, um, 
as respectfully as I can. Um, if I were a reviewer of that article before it appeared in the Great Decisions program, I would have listed three or other four sources of estimating the impact, particularly with regard to ascribing death to sanctions directly. Um, they're a very, this is a very contested research area. Um, and this article spoke to uh, obviously the authors of a study that have the highest numbers that most of us know about. So I'd want to be cautious about that. At the same time, I don't want to be in a position to say that sanctions haven't improved the capacity of really determined, and I would say grotesque leaders to make sure that certain sectors of the society pay the highest price for the combination of their policies and the denial of resources that sanctions imposes on that government. Whether it's Saddam Hussein, when the UN operationalized um, oil for food in the middle of those sanctions and delivered large crates of materials, supplies to increase food availability and medicines, he took all of those things that came from UNICEF and WHO and others, repainted them, said they come from the government of Iraq, and gave them to the members of his own political party and didn't disperse it through the rest of the country. So one might make the case, well, if you didn't have any sanctions on Saddam, then that wouldn't happen. So either indirectly sanctions are causing death or you're giving a leadership no political choice other than to protect themselves. So it's a matter of, of, of deep debate if we're talking about deaths. Do I believe the people from Nicaragua generally have a lower quality of life because they've been under sanctions for a number of years? Absolutely. Do I believe the sanctions against Cuba are an embarrassment to the United States government and United States society for how we've kept a, a, a country that could have marvelous levels of, of economic development um, back in the 1950s at every level? Uh, do I believe that once you have been unable to persuade the Myanmar regime uh, to change its ways, you should lift sanctions that might have any impact on civilians not responsible for that and find a different policy? Yes. And I do think that there's a lot of folks in the international community when you ask who makes the decisions. Um, we're in a position right now where if I had a call what's the theme of this decade of sanctions building and making? This is the, de the, the decade of humanitarian concern. We entered that uh, in the late part of the last decade, particularly in reaction to maximum pressure sanctions and seeing that this was not either philosophically or practically going to produce certain kinds of results. And the coalitions that are building within sanctioned countries and those who are the sanctioners like the United States uh, really has changed the nature of the game. And I'm not making a partisan statement uh, when I say that the combination of the UN Security Council in December of last year, creating Security Council Resolution 2664, which removed financial targeted sanctions from having any effect on international organizations doing their work on the ground. You didn't have to check out what bank you were using. You don't have to check out any of that stuff if you're delivering medical supplies, food, agricultural uh, enterprise stuff. The United Nations trusts you, go do it. And then following in January, uh, the Biden administration issued the same kind of general license to every human rights and every humanitarian organization in the US that's working in sanctioned countries. In other words, if there are people that are gonna cheat on sanctions, it's probably not bread for the world. It's not Catholic relief services. It's not brethren world service. It's gonna be illicit drug dealers and people who do gun running into civil wars. They're the focus of, of the sanctions We've got to stop making blanket sanctions and 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 we've got some momentum in that direction. All of that also means we've got to be very scrupulous about if sanctions haven't reached 
any conclusion to the change of behavior of the folks against which it's aimed after two, three, or four years, time to get a new policy. Well, I was going to ask you to kind of follow up a little bit on Cuba, because obviously we've had this sanctions against Cuba for 60 years. And uh, so, you know, what is what is sort of the motivation, do you think, to maintain these? And, you know, I think Obama's administration tried to pull back a little bit, but uh, still, I think there's a strong feeling, in, especially in Florida, I guess, that to, uh, to keep sanctions in place. What what do you think is going on there, with, especially with Cuba? If you want to win a U.S. presidency, you don't take sanctions off Cuba because you lose far out Florida in the Electoral College. Plain and simple, that explains it since the time of Jimmy Carter. I, I had the privilege of uh, having some time with the Under Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs for Carter uh, six or seven years after they had left the presidency. And um, he had helped us a great deal in understanding the Haiti case that Carter was involved in and uh, even was on the verge of maybe getting us a, a direct interview with uh, Major Cedras, who ran the country until he fled after the sanctions drove him out. Um, and I asked him once, uh, this was Bob Pastor, who passed away a long while ago now, um, how far would you have gone to ease up things in Cuba? And he said to me without missing a beat, we were determined if we won a second election, if we won a second term of office, in the same way that we felt it was important to give the Panamanians control of the canal it was now time in the late 70s to end the embargo against Cuba. Well, we know that didn't happen. Reagan came into office and partly saying, we built it, we own it, we're not giving it away about the canal. And there was no consideration about uh, Cuba. The Obama administration, I think, began a little too little, a little too late, but it had marvelous results from uh, American commercial travel, from a number of businesses in Florida, Yes, there was pushback and pushback from people who really feel that any accommodation of Cuban leadership is an insult to what happened 60 years ago. But the United States has to do what it's in its best ethical, moral, and political interests. And subjugating Cuba in this way delegitimizes every other sanctions we impose for the right reasons against really bad guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that uh, that opinion there. I appreciate that. Um, one of the, and you may argue with this as well, but one of the other uh, issues in the article uh, that was about the sort of the industry that's been built up around sanctions, that there's, you know, these sort of political and commercial entities that are really thrive because of uh, the continued use of sanctions. Is this, do you think that this is leading to an overuse of sanctions or the perpetuation of sanctions for too long? You know, what, what, how do these entities influence Congress and the administration? Well, I think, the, I, I think the author of the article would certainly say Lopez is one of the guys who should be guilty as charged uh, <laughs> because there has become an analysis, if you will, industry about sanctions. Um, I, I've read proposed bills from senators uh, about, about sanctions, wanting an opinion on how do they react and what's worked, what's not. I had the privilege of working with Senator Luger's office for a number of years. He was deeply influenced by his experience in the Philippines and the role that sanctions against Marcos and the Marcos family played in democracy coming to the Philippines. Luger was one of the leading thinkers in, in wanting to build into congressional legislation uh, a sunset clause. If sanctions don't work in two or three years, Congress will no longer support them. Boom, let's come to another policy. So, so there's been a think tank industry and university relationships with that across a number of places for a good while. But there's also lots of commercial interests. Um, there are some chambers of commerce who believe that Sanctions imposed on another country is really costly to what's going on in their region because one of one of their big trading partners is that country that's sanctioned. Makes sense to me. 
Um, there are others who would like other countries sanctioned so their exports don't compete with what you're mm -hmm. producing here. Um, I, I don't mean it cynically, but show me any public policy that's discussed in Washington for which there isn't a gigantic lobbying industry. And sanctions are no different. Sanctions may be a little bit different in the fact that there is an political intellectual class of us who move in and out of government or in and out of advisory capacities to government while also writing books and articles and appearing on great programs like this. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's not just focused just on sanctions, but it's every, every policy as you suggested. That's yeah. Uh, Look at the size of the American Medical Association's budget for influencing legislation in Washington. Yeah, it's an industry. Yeah. So, um, you know, United States used to be the main player in the global political uh, realm. China and Indi India now, of course, are, uh, have increased, their influence has increased considerably in the last few years. Has this reduced the ability of the United States to kind of enforce sanctions? Well, you know, these other players now, you mentioned the European Union as well, but they tend to be siding with us most of the time, I guess. Uh, but now China has become more of a player and, and India has kind of publicly not supported some of the sanctions against Russia. So, you know, how has this affected our ability to kind of uh, use these sanctions and force sanctions? I, I think it, it begs further the notion that you better have targeted sanctions against a small and defined group of folks in charge of a policy that the trade policies of another country can't um, undercut. Our situation with China um, has grown more and more complex. I, I my my greatest amount of experience with them is: Are they a partner in sanctions on North Korea in a way that will reduce the likelihood that North Korea becomes an aggressive nuclear power? And for a good bit of time, up until about 2017. Well, there was some leakage of goods and services across the shared long border between North Korea and China. For the most part, particularly in terms of sanctions that would constrain nuclear materials and sanctions that would not allow illicit finance to move too much through Chinese borders, the Chinese were, were quite, quite helpful. It was in their interest to constrain uh, certain aspects of North Korean behavior as well. The minute the United States engages in a trade war and its own sanctions against China, China loses all incentives for being a cooperative player on those sanctions. And so I think the moral of the story is twofold. One, again, you design sanctions in a way in which if you want a political outcome, you better thoroughly focus on the leadership and sanctions targeted against that leadership, but you also better think about where are the support structures that that target might appeal to that would create an undercut of the sanctions. And this brings us to the flip side of sanctions, if you will. Sometimes sanctions are meant to deny resources, but the flip side called an incentive, the carrot, which is matched with the stick of sanctions, sometimes you can use that on the country like a China that is tempted to undercut the sanctions and in a sense, buy their loyalty, <laughs> buy their cooperation, incentivize that they don't undercut the system. So the second lesson is your sanctions policy ought to be within a larger strategic vision in which you calculate what's going on in certain kinds of regions. If India is less dependent on Russia, we have more cooperation uh, of India in isolating Russia. If India wants to assert, we've always been non-aligned, so we can't join any of this, then you're not going to be able to change that behavior. But if you can substitute to India the goods that are coming from Russia and be an outlet for their exports to Russia to your new markets, then maybe you've got more cooperation. All right, well, th thank you. I, I think um, 
I have a couple more questions here, but I, I guess I'd like to kind of open it up to some of our uh, our participants. Uh, you know, it's always good to get kind of the point of, uh, of folks that have uh, signed up for the program. And uh, so Mel Miller, I had a comment and I'd like Mel to. Okay, uh, I was, okay. I was just curious. Uh, I saw recently where an American company, BAT, was fined $635 million for selling cigarettes to North Korea in violation of the sanction. How could selling cigarettes to North Korea be, in, <clears throat> be anything that would bring about change in that country? And who actually benefited and lost in a situation like that? Yeah, thank you, Mel. That's a, that's a good and important question. Um, North Korea is the most sanctioned country on the face of the earth, uh, in some respects, unfortunately, but that's where a combination of international policy at the UN, regional policies from the EU, and policies from the United States have all come together. And in the financial and trade areas, trade is permitted only for humanitarian goods and exchange of funds is not permitted at all unless it's monitored and approved by the Office of Financial Assets Control, OFAC, within the U.S. Treasury. The fine in that case is less about tobacco isn't a necessary life good. In fact, it might be the reverse. The fine in that case is they didn't appeal for an OFAC license when they engaged in the operation. They didn't make the case before the Treasury that they had an engaged relationship that would not produce benefits to the North Koreans. What the North Koreans did with those cigarettes that they paid for is they found ways to make it part of the illicit tobacco network that they sell to the rest of Southeast Asia. So it's the old classic, you sell me this good and I'll pay you a dollar, and then I'm gonna take that good because I'm not the end user and I'm gonna sell it for $3. And I'll get the money on the illicit illegal money market for tobacco products that the sanctions prohibit me from getting in the first place. All right, thanks, Mel. That, that's an interesting uh, kind of conundrum, I guess. You know, how do you, how do you track that kind of second and third level kind of uh, movement of goods or services or dollars or whatever it is that's being transmitted? Regular international trade rules call for what's called end user declarations. The end user importing the good from somewhere signs the documents and guarantees they will remain in the domestic environment. And then if you're in a sanctioned situation and we're monitoring like crazy what goes in and out of a country, we'll find out whether or not an end user agreement has been violated. This is a part of my own prior service on the North Korea experts panel in 2010-11, where what we were watching was an unusual number of turbines moving from Eastern European markets to places like Libya, Pakistan, and one or two countries like Malaysia. But there were no industries in those countries that could possibly use that amount of turbines. What happened was Bulgaria sold it to Libya that said, yes, we're using it for this and this, but secretly they were selling it to North Korea for the use and the development of their own nuclear industry. So you've got to be able to monitor this through the networks you can find. The big technological advantage for the North Korea group that I worked with is we now have things like Planet, Google Earth, and the like, and we can see ships moving on an hourly basis from one port to the other and estimate pretty, pretty strongly what is going into those ships from the same kind of satellite views that we get on what happened on the dock. 
Well, it's, it's uh, maybe part of that industry you were talking about. Uh, yeah, of, uh, absolutely. Com a compliance industry as well. Yeah. Um, Lois Meyer, one of our regulars here, I think has a question. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Very, very interesting. Um, I'm always interested in what other countries are doing toward the US. And my question is, has any country ever sanctioned the US in the past or now? Or are we just too economically powerful for them to do that? Um, thank you so much, Lois. And, and everyone, please, on the screen, even Betty and Ray, I suggest this too. Um, my mother gave me a wonderful first name, George. Oh. I'm fine with you calling me George, but thank you. Um, well, okay. at the highest level, when we sanctioned the Russians after the 2014 invasion of Crimea, um, they turned around and they sanctioned a number of US government people and uh, a number of airlines and others constraining their activities going into Russia. So um, it wasn't the size and scale of what we imposed on the Russians, but they kind of said, well, you just can't sanction us, we'll sanction you. Um, the same thing happened with the pattern of China under uh, President Trump. Uh, the number of goods that the US used to sell into China has been limited. Air travel is limited. Um, I don't think anyone on the screen or very many people in the US hold major bank accounts in China. But if you did, it might have been frozen for six months to a year as retribution for the original sanctions. Uh, there are more and more sanctions on individuals who are US citizens mm -hmm. because of their particular activity in an economic sense or their role in helping and abating the US sanctions enterprise itself. Uh, but the notion that another country has completely decided to isolate itself from the United States economically as a punishment against the US. North Korea decided that, but we had no economic relationship with them. Okay. Now, if the UK decides they want to impose sanctions on the US, it's a whole different story, or France or others, which leads to kind of the interesting paradox that economically sanctions which hurt the most and which have the most immediate impact are those among high trading and high economic friends, if you will. Sanctioning folks who are your enemies that you have very little to do with doesn't give you very much leverage. Mm -hmm. But the economic interdependence, if you decide to break that through sanctions, wow. So mm -hmm. the United States could be a target of certain kinds of countries in our most vulnerable areas of imports. Mm -hmm. Or if the globe bound together and said, no more US tourists coming to any of our shores. <laughs> no US tourist is welcome globally. Keep all your money at home, go to Nebraska. <laughs> then, then that would have an impact, but it would have an impact on them too that's unacceptable so they don't choose that sanction. Yeah. Hey. Right. Well, thanks, Lois. Yeah. Okay, uh, Betty, I think you had a question. You're muted right now. Uh, thanks, Ray. My husband's name is George. So that is a fine name. Indeed. <laughs> uh, Kayla has always fascinated me. And I am old enough to remember and, and attended a Catholic school that received many Cuban uh, students when they came in the 1960s, I'm aging myself. <laughs> but I may say something like this in, the, in class, the students are calculating how many years ago that was. Yeah. And um, I could understand they were running for fear of Castro, how supportive they were, Batista. Um, unclear. Unclear. But I'm actually surprised, and, and, and they, of course, would have been anti-communist and of what they saw in Ravel afterward. And not that future generations would be more supportive of 
communism in the country, but I've been a little surprised what you said, because it is true um, that, that the, the, the concern, the, the, very, the, the very conservative voter that the Florida voter is when it comes to that particular issue or many issues, um, I thought future generations, particularly for the, the children and certainly the grandchildren getting away from that would want to see more relations open up, to remove the sanctions, to, 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 to go back in. And I was a little surprised it didn't happen. And can you maybe reflect just a little bit as to why, did the, did the future generations coming from the original conservative parents, are they as conservative or as rigid or what explains that other than the communism, I can understand that, but oh my gosh, I mean, we also saw what happened when Obama lived to that. My brother, I went on a, a, a cruise that took in Cuba and he still talks about it because we were so fascinated, but Americans want to go there. There's a beach, let's go. Um, so can you explain what this inter, into now future generations resistance is? Um, I'll take a crack at it. Okay. It, it's it, it, it's a lot like an onion. You've got to peel away layers and layers and layers. The first is the expropriation of land and of the sugar cane companies, particularly Domino Sugar, between 59 and 63, created conditions that were really unusual. The seizure of an American company and a country that said to its plantation owners, we've got to rectify this system and involve more and more diverse agricultural and more and more peasants actually becoming workers um, was a combination of radical communism, or was so portrayed, and an assault on America's highest value, property. And all the laws in place then meant that you could have no relationship with that country if the properties weren't restored. So you have a dilemma that whether or not grandpa's 96 or young Freddie is 16, that government stole our home. Right. Right. And that's passed from generation until generation. Uh, it may be that when the 16 year old becomes 26, they say, grandpa, get over it. Come on. It's still our country. Let's go be part of it because they have a more open understanding and a willingness to engage in this. Right. The second level is in order to change the sanctions on Cuba, you have an incredible multi-layered set of congressional laws about the conditions under which the US will lift the sanctions and presidential or let's say administrative dynamics, one of which is the International Emergency Economic and Political Whatever Act. Um, so, so Obama went three quarters of the way to what his presidential powers would give him to improve relationships with Cuba. But there were many in Congress, particularly those sympathetic to Cubans and those in Florida that said, unless the amendments are made and passed by Congress that sets up a commission to adjudicate this expropriation of companies and land, there can be no normalization of relations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so we've got ourselves into a 60 year complex of laws, interactions, where if you asked the average American, is the threat from Cuba so substantial that they should be so heavily sanctioned, they, they're just going to say either, 
well, it's always been that way. They haven't behaved themselves until they change leaders. We won't change this. Well, all the Castros are about dead and gone. <laughs> yeah. And some of these leaders still call themselves socialists. Okay. Um, socialism will always be a bad word in a American political context. And industry-wise, Ray, there is a Cuba lobby that is one of the strongest anti-normalization of relations between two countries that exist in the United States. And they're people who used to own property, who blessed them, picked themselves up by their bootstraps, came to the United States, made their money, made a fortune, were fortunate enough to be in Miami and take advantage of the boom of Florida and Miami. And they control Florida politics. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, good question there, Betty. Uh, Claire, you got a comment? Or qu I actually had a question there, Claire. Um, yeah, I got this idea when you were discussing, has any other country ever sanctioned the U.S.? And I was just wondering if, um, could tariffs be considered a low level of sanctioning? Sure. Yeah. If, if we understand the great decisions framework, they're interested in economic policies by which one country or group of countries can punish another. And certainly a tariff is because it says your goods are so attractive and so well-made or well-priced that they're coming in in large, large numbers to us. And somehow you believe that your French wines are much more tasty than our central Indiana wines, with all due respect. <laughs> and therefore, you're priced at this point, and our, our wines, even though they're a little bit less priced, um, are still not winning the day. We're going we're gonna to push your price per bottle just out of sight for most Americans most of the time through that tariff. That's a form of economic aggression in the minds of the countries that experience it or the wine growers who experience it, which is why things like free trade thinking and limiting tariffs has been the dominant mode for most of America's economic uh, agenda, except in times of exceptional threat from a particular product on an American industry. All right, that's, that's very interesting. I'm glad you used that example of wine. A reminder, if you want to sign up for our wine tasting uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, go to our website and, and register. Okay. Got to slip that a little. little. Uh, I saw okay. him kind of giving me a hurt when I mentioned about coming oh, to man. the and I our wines. Yeah, George, come on down. <laughs> if I can <laughs> a glass of cap, so can you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Michael Shackleton has a question for us. You're muted, Michael. Okay. Yes, yeah. we hear you. Um, my biggest friend, if I could call it, is India. Um, and India is very skeptical of the United States. And I think that might be a weak point in our um, uh, um, sanctions. But uh, the people in uh, the leaders in Italy, India would say that we uh, tolerated despots and in, in leaders in other countries uh, who are equally as bad as in Russia, for instance. And we tolerated them because they maintained order. And India, of course, is beset with the relations with China and relations with Russia and other countries, and they have decided not to support the United States. Is this a weakness that uh, may uh, hurt us down the road? Uh, um, I just want to have a comment about, about uh, the status of India with regard to sanctions. Yeah. Um... I think it's a very important question because you really nailed the what some would say aggressiveness of India about this, and some would say uh, smart, self-interested assertiveness of India. Uh, the India 
problem to the extent to which it exists, and I'm not sure it's a problem, it does pose a, a challenge that to build unanimity of purpose and agreement on policies like sanctions is pretty near impossible, either because of the economic interests of a state or of certain countries feeling like if it wasn't for that dominance of the US dollar around the world, these folks in the US couldn't have sanctions really have the kind of bite they have. And they wouldn't be bold enough to try to sanction groups, whether they're in Nicaragua or elsewhere, because they wouldn't have leverage. And we as a major power in India, we as a group that should be on the Security Council as a permanent member in a in a reconstructed United Nations, we shouldn't have to put up with this anymore. We have a strong enough economy that we can hold off the United States. And by gosh, we're going to do it. And over the last 10 to 15 years, there's many different ways that they have operationalized this. And they've been joined by places like Brazil and South Africa. South Africa being one of the great ironies here because South Africa would not be the country of majority rule that it is right now if it wasn't for economic sanctions imposed by the international community up until the early 90s when the government changed. But Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa take the first letter of those five countries, and you have what's called the BRICS, the countries that want a new understanding of international sanctions and the dominance of Western countries in the global community that gives them this coercive power. And so we're going to see this kind of uh, semi-rebellion, if you will. Um, and and some of that is not bad for American policy, even if it's non-cooperative, because it pushes on you if you're in the State Department or U.S. Treasury. Are you refining sanctions enough that they can still do their job without complete agreement of all countries at all time? I don't know if that does that does that give you some kind of answer or am I still yes, dancing yes, around this? Michael? Yes. OK, I guess the other thing I would add is. Um, India is just fine with the technological sanctions limits we've imposed on the Pakistanis with regard to development of their nuclear program. Thank you, <laughs> they would say. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, Audrey Weinbanga, I think you're uh, you're up next here. Yes, I want to thank you for uh, helping to us to understand a little bit better. My question is, with the global economic connections shifting, as you suggest that sanction pressure is controlled uh, by uh, lobbyists, uh, is there a new form being hatched that can explore ways that could be more effective? especially with AI becoming more invasive. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Audrey. Um, I wouldn't wanna give the impression that uh, sanctions inputs and sanctions policy is essentially solely in the hands of lobbyists, uh, especially lobbyists with dollar signs attached to them before and after the word lobby. Um, sanctions against Rhodesia and South Africa in the 60s and 70s, uh, respectively, that carried all the way through the 90s, were primarily pushed by um, human rights experts and church-based groups in the United States and UK. Um, sanctions against Sudan in its terrible activities in Darfur in the 90s and, and uh, 2000s were the product of humanitarian organizations and others uh, creating a push for this. Um, I think that the growth of new technologies of various kinds each impose a, um, 
a new challenge, not only to sanctions, but to various other forms of diplomacy. Um, let me give you one or two examples that are, are solidly examples of that, and then turn to AI as you ask it. Um, one of the classic tools of sanctions against a dictatorship would be to limit the amount of technology that could be immediately traded to a dictatorship uh, so that they couldn't engage in things like surveillance, the greater amounts of surveillance of their population. They couldn't engage with specialized communication with secret police in their country. So you would withhold uh, communications technologies. You'd, you'd strip them of access to certain kinds of of satellites and towers and various things so they couldn't communicate. Well, what we heard from the groups in sanctioned countries that were average citizens, if you prohibit cell phones from coming into North Korea because they are traded all to the government, then you also prevent them coming into us as citizens. And it's our best way of communicating and, and, and having a computer is the best way of getting the news that's not fed to us from the government's propaganda machine. So with technological changes and the flow of information, we found out that while we wanted to immediately isolate a government that they don't have control of that, we effectively took it away from the opposition or the good people or the average people. So how do you balance that out? That was one way to do it. The other way, something that uh, I spent a lot of time on in the last 12 months was in the old days when we worried about North Korea getting illicit, illegal monies to make use of so they could build more sophisticated weapons by the illegal purchase of nuclear material, we went after counterfeiting that North Korea was great at uh, in the early 2000s. We went after money laundering that they were able to maneuver from illicit sales of things. And we went after false bank accounts that they would create and false companies that would sell you something which you actually never received, but they kept receiving this money. And so in 2010, 11, when I was on the monitoring team, that's what was one of my assignments. Find out where that money is. You stop the money, you stop them from importing all these highly technical gyroscopes and goods to make weapons comes 2022-23, what is the finance expert in the North Korea panel engaged in? The analysis of cryptocurrency and the ways in which the North Koreans robbed $680 million from the bank at Leshdesi Bank through hacking and put it hidden on the blockchain through 160 different accounts immediately within six hours and then dispersed it to a point where we couldn't find it anymore until an interesting finding of about 3 million of that dollars occurred last November. So that technological change, the emergence of the cyber networks mm -hmm. of blockchain money laundering and all of those things confront us. What does AI do to sanctions? It tells any false story you want which can lead you to bad decision-making. It, let's say, in terms of wanting to protect a population from adverse effects of sanctions when the sanctions aren't supposed to hurt their daily way of life, imagine the stories you can generate about US sanctions or international sanctions, starving children in the streets and the, the way you can attach photo and other things to that without any element of truth to them. Or imagine a group in a powerful country like UK or the United States or France finding itself confronted with more and more information about the development of a nuclear program in, let's say, a, a Vietnam, when in fact there's no such program but you're looking at the news feeds that so show centrifuges spinning uranium into weapons grade uranium levels. How do we know that's true? 
how do how do how do we base a policy on this? So when people talk in the last months as they have that AI is a game changer, this is one of the areas it may very well be as well. But hopefully, sanctions being a relatively small part of global policy, we can maintain some standards of double checking, triple checking, and validating and not be swayed by false information or caricatures of things being more serious than they really are. All right. Thanks, George. That, that's, uh, to me, uh, that's probably one of the, uh, I don't want to say scary is maybe it's too strong a word, but it's, I'm concerned a lot about this, uh, these deep fakes that are kind of on the horizon. Yeah. You know? It's like, how do you trust anything that you see or hear? And so it's going to be an interesting, interesting few years in the next couple of years. Uh, I think Larry uh, Chimino has a question for us. Yeah, thanks, Ray. And, and thanks, George. This is fascinating. And uh, You've uh, uncovered aspects of uh, of this that I hadn't really really thought about, particularly some of the the, the politics behind it, the uh, the uh, financial interests behind it, and the various groups. But it just made me think about whether you've done research or people have thought about the way sanctions work within the United States on different um, industries, states. I mean, it reminded me of the uh, RIFRA thing that happened uh, here in in Indiana, for example where a number of groups decided they weren't going to take their their uh, uh, conventions to Indiana because of the, the policies. I'm thinking of, of, of boycotts. And I'm wondering if, uh, you know, if you've thought about the way sanctions work within the United States against groups, against states, against policies and so forth. Uh, and if there's ways to that we should think about applying sanctions uh, to address some of the big issues we have, for example, with domestic terrorism or for policies that affect different uh, races, genders, gender identities, and so forth, uh, that are imposed on folks by, you know, by, by state law or by corporations that act in a particular way. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, generally we're thinking outside the United States between countries, but I'm thinking within the United States, what, uh, you know, what's, What's your thought about uh, the effectiveness of sanctions within the United States? I think this is an integral part of our history, sometimes by other names. Um, not only did they toss the tea over those boats in Boston Harbor, but many of the pro-revolutionary communities against the British in the 1770s made sure they went door to door that people weren't buying British tea. So there was a collective embargo because we weren't going to buy the king's product nor pay the king's taxes on the product. We could gut it out and drink beer. Fast forward to the 1950s and 60s. What led the civil rights movement in this country? Bus boycotts, right? And the decision of NAACP and other groups to decide not to do Easter outfit shopping in downtown Nashville this Easter. And maybe the economic impact would lead the folks in Woolworths or other stores to understand you can no longer reject people sitting at your lunch counters by the color of their skin but at the same time, you want them to go upstairs and buy the Easter hat or Easter tie to wear to church on Easter Sunday. Or the Nestle International boycott in the 70s and 80s, worried about infant formula kinds of things. Um, this is citizen movements, use of economic tools, and our economic tools have increased over time. But again, I'd raise the issue not only is this more vibrant going on in our history and in the states than we recognize, which is why your question's so good, but so too is the flip side. No one in this audience who's raised a teenager fails to understand what it means to incentivize behavior, <laughs> right? Um, we can incentivize the behavior of healthcare systems. We can incentivize the behavior and responsibility of companies towards the environment or other kinds of things, because we decide to purchase goods from those companies that 
seem to have something other than just the profit margin in mind. And we vote with our feet, either by buying stocks or buying their products. Um, we might also interpret certain legislative moves in certain areas of the country that are trying to bar companies from using standards of environmental good and the like from doing so as a sanction by government against private and social groups taking action that they don't want to legislate themselves. They think it's just their purview to legislate as the state legislature. We'll tell you how much environment gets improved. You guys can't go out and do it on your own. You know, remember, we're living in a state here in Indiana, which has an unusual kind of penalty on electronic vehicles as they emerge. Your license plate costs are astronomical for having an electronic vehicle compared to your standard vehicle. And I think it's the case too with hybrids. I'll learn that soon because our RAV4 is a hybrid and we've got to go get a license. So, you know, it goes both ways. In some respects, the embargo, the boycott, the sanction can be something along with incentives that gives more citizen power and can be much more effective uh, in our in our local politics and might even say, dare I say, our progressive politics than we've been fully conscious of in the past. All right, thank you. Thanks, Larry, for that question. Um, yes, it does, I have one of each, a hybrid and a fully electric car, and the fees are astronomical. There you go. So anyhow, be prepared for that. Um, I have a question about uh, non-state actors. You, you mentioned briefly about Al-Qaeda and um, these terrorist organizations. You know, they, there's no location to them. There's no economy to them that's yeah. uh, obvious. So how do we, how do we use sanctions to, to uh, impact these organizations? Yeah, and, and thank you. This is really important because, you know, somebody could ask the question, well, how many, how many nations does the United States have sanctions on? And the answer would be, it varies almost month to month, but somewhere between 17 and 21. How many individuals or entities do we have sanctions on? Somewhere between 8,900 and 10,000. Oh, wow. Somebody say, we've got sanctions on 10,000 different kinds of people or corporations or entities? Yes. Why? Because in a global economy, individuals have power of movement of monies to do good or to do ill. Um, companies could engage in legal international trade or finance or illegal international trade or finance. Or individuals or countries might not respect and abide by the sanctions that are imposed by the UN or the US on a particular country. And like the tobacco sales that was mentioned earlier in our Q&A, um, you're fined for violating those sanctions. That company is. Um, as a result of 9-11 and the non-state actor called Al-Qaeda, the ability to find assets based on the names of individuals, and even the somewhat social movement presence of this thing, Al-Qaeda, meant within the first month of 9-11, the combination of the European Union, the United States, and the UN's push to do this locked down about 85% of the low-hanging fruit assets of Al-Qaeda. We bankrupted Al-Qaeda within the first six months. Very, very critical to its later military and political defeat and its demise within the decade. But enter ISIS or Desh as it's called by those participants later in the terrible violence within countries like Iraq and Syria and ISIS as a sort of supercharged Al-Qaeda, learned the lessons 
of the sanctions against those individuals and groups. And what did they do? They robbed banks, not held any money in banks. They seized areas of the Middle East that produced oil and became illicit oil exporters. They kidnapped people and demanded ransom in gold or in dollars. So it's like our old experience of watching the Western movies. The bad guys come in and get a load of money and take off. The sheriff puts together the posse and you're tracking these folks and you're always two days behind. Now enter what? The world of cryptocurrency where the new targets for individual or entity sanctions are professional hackers, money launderers, people running illicitly, um, companies that hide behind the blockchain to move money to launder in new and different ways. So the real world of commerce, the real world of finance, while the rules are set by national decision makers, we know it's always been the local bank, the local entrepreneur, the individual. And sanctions now after 2001 essentially see more of their targets being those groups because those are the folks who either violate sanctions certain kinds of ways and we can isolate that activity and punish that individual or entity rather than go after major nation states. Yeah. Well, it's, it sounds like a much more complicated uh, approach to this. But... I, I interviewed early on in 2004 two major bank presidents in the US about what it meant for them to be building a system called Know Thy Depositor mm -hmm. and to be able to do this in a systematic way that you caught the bad guys but didn't catch the innocent. And one of them said something to me that stayed with me all these years. And they said, George, it was a bad era if your first name was Muhammad because it meant your bank account was immediately locked down and they examined every aspect of who you were and what you were doing. And it might take a very, very good long time before they said, nope, you're just an average Muhammad. You're not Muhammad Atta or you're not Muhammad, this guy who works for Al-Qaeda. So there were also some excesses as sometimes there are in sanctioned situations. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Betty here in a second, but I did want to remind folks that, um, you know, one of our roles as the uh, as a council, member of the Council on World Affairs is that we support other international organizations in the state. And uh, in two weeks, there's a, or two weekends from now, there'll be a couple of events at the Global Village Welcome Center. Uh, one is uh, on the African, by the African Council of Indiana and the Ukrainian Society of Indiana. And you can uh, look at our website. We have some information about those there. I think you'll find them kind of interesting. Um, and again, don't forget our wine tasting coming up. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Betty. And I have one last question, uh, George. Um, my husband, George, and I lived in, in um, well, we were in Southern Africa for, for several years, including South Africa. And we were there during apartheid and after apartheid. Um, and we were, we, the, the economic sanctions hurt the black population. Didn't really, it, it inconvenienced the whites. Uh, what we were really against was the boycotts of educators and performing artists because it was a police state and under a police state and that meant people in South Africa were gonna be restricted to what the government wanted you to read and hear and, and the exchanges between people and of course the value of that. We thought, no, that, that's, that's the wrong sanction. The sanction we felt that really hurt all South Africans, including whites, was a sports boycott. It broke their hearts that they couldn't compete internationally. Literally, I mean, people who are sports fanatics would understand that, but it, South Africa is a sports mania country like any, any other country. And then their beloved, um, can't think of the name, Springbok, uh, their rugby team, oh, yeah. it broke hard. They couldn't compete internationally. I mean, just 
And, and that really as much as anything. But I wanted to ask you a question. You said that our sanctions were responsible in part for the one party state that South Africa is today, which is SAT, the ANC. Why did you say that? Um, because by sanctions playing a role in the transition to majority rule, yeah. it seems to me a bitter irony that the current leaders of the ANC and the current leaders of South Africa are so diametrically opposed to certain sanctions, including in the African content, mm -hmm. continent, um, simply because they feel the dominance of U.S. and international financial affairs stifles some of what they want to do, not internally, but what they want to do in the international market with gold. And I don't, I'm not one of these people who's saying they should be grateful for what happened, okay, mm -hmm. because sanctions help produce the end of apartheid, which gives grounds then for their leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not talking here about sour grapes. I'm talking that it's interesting for a country that in very much living memory was a beneficiary of sanctions. It then turns against the tool, not in its worst form, but in any form. Mm -hmm. And let me add a couple of things to what you said there. One of the things that makes South Africa a very important case historically is, you know, many in the United States were concerned that we were so damaging the overall economy, we were hurting the average African in South Africa. The labor unions and the churches said, we support the sanctions. This is short-term hurt to deal with the big historical repression, we'll back it. And that pushed more and more. Um, the Reagan administration struggled with this tremendously with views on both sides. Secondly, what you mentioned is intriguing because sports sanctions are often seen as symbolic. This is not some straw that breaks the camel's back. It's just a little straw. It has to be only four or five years ago, and I'm on an international panel in Europe with various governmental people, one of whom is a South African guy who says to me during the break time, he had read some of our studies about the South African sanctions. He said, yeah, he said, no question. It was the right thing to do, et cetera, but you never should have sanctioned rugby. There was no reason for that. There was no reason. For this is now 20 years later. And he's yes. vehement. I mean, you experienced it too, right? He's vehement. Yeah. He's never yeah. sanctioned they That's were terrible, and, the, and there's and he's still angry about it <laughs> yeah yeah but we're also in the midst of this as well what do you do with russian athletes in yeah. the olympics and other you know yeah so exactly. sports sanctions travel sanctions diplomatic sanctions look like they're just easy things to do on paper they don't have an effect when imelda marcos could no longer come to the united states to buy shoes things began to fall apart well, when Oliver Temple became president after Mandela, one of the things that he wanted to introduce was a suppression of the press complaining about the government as press does. You know, the minute you go, you know, to the best of my ability, the journalists are just tearing you apart, so to speak. Yeah. And he wanted to, you know, that the government is new and fragile and you shouldn't be. And I thought, oh my God, you know, you can't, that's censorship. You know, you you yeah. shape against that. That's that was one of the things of a police state. So yeah, it's been really difficult watching what's going on in South Africa for many reasons. Thank you very much. Whoa. Boy, this is where I wish we could go to the bar now and carry it. <laughs> you know, this has been a fantastic discussion this evening. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. This has really been, and the fact that you are, have played such a major, you know, that you're such a, close to the pulse of it, and you're not bringing this to us just academically, and your research tells you, but this is a part of what you've been, and you're like, by the way, the Quakers, I did my dissertation on the Quakers in South Africa, and their social witness against apartheid, and they ran into trouble with the Quakers 
the AFSC in America and the British Friends Service Committee because they did not support sanctions. Yeah. And, and you might remember that de they did not. Uh, George and I were having quite a bit of discussion about Quakers before you all came on. They did it, and that put them in trouble with the world of Quakers. Yeah. Um, so, but they were very small, very very small. But, but they were also these to have people who are on opposite sides, but both arguing from conscience is oh, a yeah. good thing. Yeah, uh, but thank you. This has been absolutely a wonderful evening. And I think thank this you all. is a wonderful way for us to end our program year on this kind of a high of a great discussion. You know, George, one of the things I tell people and encourage them to please, please come to our discussions is that they are 90 minutes. We allow the first 45 minutes with what we did today. Uh, when we were still in person, the person could just sort of have a PowerPoint and carry on. But as you know, in Zoom, it's a little hard to sit still uh, for them. And so I think the moderated discussion with the questions still gives the speaker a lot of time to, to carry on. But we have always had for, for a long time a robust Q&A where the public gets to engage with the speaker. And that just makes it so wonderful. You've been friendly and easy to engage with. And we appreciate that as well. Sometimes our speakers are not as forthcoming as we like to add with the questions, but you've been fantastic. So thank you. And folks, I other than coming and drinking with us in a few weeks, uh, which we hope if you're nearby, please consider it. We'd love to see you in person, if that's possible, May the 23rd. Nothing to register, and uh, the, the, and, the, and the glasses are going to be very reasonably priced, and I and you won't be disappointed. So, and they do have dry as well as sweet. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll not be disappointed. So, this is our last evening, folks. I want to thank you so Happy much. Year too. Thank you. Happy year, too. Happy year at this winery. Happy year at wine and water and iced tea, I'm sure. And also, you can bring your children, right, Claire? Uh, right. And service dogs. And um, uh, it's wheelchair accessible, too. Nice parking. And it is a beautiful setting. It's a really a summer evening. It'll and we'll be indoors in case it rains. Who cares? It'll be a lovely setting. So I look forward to seeing you. I won't ask for a show of hands, but uh, so George, come on down. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Good See night. you all. Bye. See you in a few months. Thanks, George. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Larry, nice to see you again. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>